about life. Uh, but today, because I'm going to be talking about things that are sacred to my people, uh, a lot of the stuff that I'll be talking about uh, concerns uh, the black people. I come from the Blood Reserve from Ghana. So I'm a Ghana woman, Ghana. So uh, I'm going to share some of my people's ways with you, especially our sacred ways. Uh, I guess you could say I'm kind of a grandmother. This morning I had uh, one of my holy children here. When we uh, transfer holy things, whoever you transfer the holy article to becomes your child. So I have a lot of holy children. Uh, I've got four children of my own. I also have a stepson, and I've got 12 grandchildren. Uh, I came from a, I come from the many children clan on my uh, mother, uh, my father's side, and I come from, uh, I come from the many big Jewish clan. Um, my mother's side. Uh, my uh, my dad's clan, they were real jokesters, so um, I hope my finger doesn't hit you. So. <laughs> uh, but uh, right off, I wanted to share something with you. I got this for a gift, and this piece of tobacco that I got so special to me that I thought, yeah, I'm going to share this knowledge with you. Do you know what power this tobacco has? Every cut, every sprain I've had in my life was cured by this. People think my colds were cured by it. My sinuses were cured by it. We use this for medicine. If anybody has a cut, does anybody have a cut? Let me doctor you. <laughs> <laughs> what we do is we take this in our mouth, we wet it, and then we put it on the cut, we band-aid it. It stings like the dickens, but the next day when you look at your cut, it'll be shut, it won't be open anymore. If you have a cold, they uh, mix lard, mix it with lard, and they spread it on a piece of paper, and they put it on your chest. So as soon as you uh, it starts burning, you take it off, and it'll break up your palm. If you have a sprain, it's not going to heal your sprain, but it'll take the sweating down, swelling, sweating down, swelling. When I talk too much, I start talking, you know, because I teach at a black but language now. When I start to talk black it all day, I start saying burger treat instead of burger. <laughs> Take about a piece that big, you boil it in four cups of water, stick a rag in there and put it on, on your spring part. It'll take the swelling down so, um, so that you uh, can move because a lot of the times when you have a spring it's so swollen that you can't move, but this will get you to move. Now that I've given my commercial for tobacco, <laughs> among my people, I would say that we had one foot in the spirit world and one foot in the real world. My people had the sun dance. The sun dance was led by a woman. She didn't do the actual ceremony, but it has to be a woman. 
that decides, okay, we're going to have a sun dance this year. And this woman has to be a virgin. Either a dream will come to her, or there'll be sickness in the family, or, you know, some major thing that they want to shift the energy. So, she'll vow a sun dance. And uh, during that sun dance ceremony, she has to take care of everything. You know, she has lots of helpers and stuff like that. Ladies, there's some seats up here. There's a seat here and there's another seat. Uh, do you want a seat? I'm just worried about your mom. I 
Moses' whole lodge was full of holy things. And you keep pointing to that one. And the one she brought back was the sun dance. They let her down on this big long world back to her. And the people were like, what's that? What's that? And there this girl came back and she had this sun dance. And uh, so that's how our sun dance ceremony came about. Below the sun dance, we have our beaver bundles, or has water pipes, but they really honor everything in my environment. Everything in my environment is in there. My sacred stone that I'm carrying, this is what you call an inisku. This is what brought the buffaloes back when they left us. And this buffalo stone sang to the young girl and she taught the songs to the elders and they brought the buffalo back. So it's all in this beaver bundle. The beaver bundle could take a whole day to transfer because all the animals, all the everything, trees, rocks, and every animal gave a song, except for the, except for the uh, frog. The frog wanted a gold-plated invitation and didn't get one. <laughs> and apparently the frog had a beautiful voice, and for not giving part of his self to the sacred thing that the Creator wanted to give to the people, um, he just says, ribbit, ribbit, ribbit. But anyways, this uh, beaver bundle, um, we didn't have a beaver bundle ceremony among the black people for about over 20 years. And then uh, my husband and I, we, we, we had one and we had a man that could sing the songs. And so he taught us, and he used to say, look for a woman that can be the female, because I can't be the dancer. So we found an old lady that, that could still be the songs, and she came, and she was my, my holy mother for the beaver bundle. When we transfer things in my culture, you not only gain a child, but you have, you're responsible for that person for the rest of your life. They're your holy children, I'm their holy mother. I'm traveling with one of my holy children this weekend, and um, she has, a, we have a little granddaughter and uh, that's traveling with us. In the old days, uh, these children, like we'd see a smart kid, and we didn't just call them smart Alex. We took them into the lodge because we knew they would continue the process. These young kids were brought in, and they became helpers at the Sundance. They became miniature beaver bundle owners. They became part of our ceremonies, and we called them mini Boca. But these mini bags were the ones that studied, that always heard the song. And they were the ones that we go to, to tell them, hey, do you remember when you were at that ceremony? What song did they sing? And they sing it for us as they grow older. So that's how we kept our, our culture going, was because we would take a child and bring them in and educate them in these things. Below the beaver bundle we have the uh, medicine pipes and this is where our government starts. Below this we have societies. 
among my people, we still have the Horn Society, uh, Crazy Dogs. I just about wrote Mad Dogs in English. <laughs> And uh, they each had a very important role to play. In the old days, when we were going to pick a new chief, the old people, the elders, would open one of these medicine pipe bundles. The Blackfeet medicine pipe bundles are about that long, and the whole bundle is about that big. It's my sacred duty to carry it on my back. That's how we move them around. And it has a special tripod that I lay it down on. I rest it on, or in front of my teepee, it hangs over the door like that. They have special way of tying it there. So, if my uh, medicine bundle is out here, nobody goes in front of my, my lodge. Uh, the medicine type people, nobody walks in front of them. And when I go into a uh, teepee, the owner of the lodge sleeps here. The girl children sleep on this side. The boys sleep on here, uh, on the north side. Our uh, doorway, the black feet keep is always towards the east, where the sun rises. And so <clears throat> the boys would be on the north side, the girls on the south side. And the owner, we uh, generally have an altar here the fire pit and the only people that can come in and make a complete circle in the lodge are the people that own it. If you're a woman, you come in and you sit down here, you're high status, you sit up here. And the same for the men. A medicine pipe owner would sit next to the, the owner of the TP of lower status. When we had meetings, we were called to the medicine pipe owner's lodge. And the woman that sat by the door, the lowest status woman, would be here. She'd get first say, the women talk first, and the women, the men agreed with us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, princess? You like Dora too? I like Dora too. Hola. <laughs> so, uh, when they were having a meeting, it would be, they'd be called to this medicine type person. In the old days, before anybody else could break camp, the medicine type owner's lodge had to be down, and he had to be on the move and then the rest of the camp follow. If anybody messed with a medicine man, it was his sacred duty to kill whoever messed with him. That's how strict the rules were. In my culture in the old days, if somebody stepped over a moral boundary, somebody did that did something very bad, we didn't like bad apples, so we, that's one reason we killed for When we went to against our enemies, all we wanted to do was make them cry or take their weapons away. Because our belief system was they have family too, and they have loved ones that they need to go back to. We killed if we had to, but the norm you became a bigger chief if you knocked your enemy off a horse. You even became a bigger chief if you took his guns away or his bow and arrows away. You became a great chief if you made him cry. But um, if you killed him, yeah, you can do that. Even a woman.
happened. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think the killing really came with the Europeans. But our people, you know, like the, our most noted chiefs were the ones. We had one chief that uh, killed uh, a Cree named White Dog, Kapiomita. And their song sung about the sky, and um, he was uh, he was a friend of my uh, my mom's great uncle, Bert Rattler from Montana, and uh, they really played jokes on each other. And this guy from our reserve went down to the Browning tribe and said, "Oh, I hear about so and uh, oh, what's his name." The guy that killed uh, Apiumita. Uh, what does he look like? He said, oh, you should see his hair. He has braids down to there. Talk about a tall, handsome, blackfoot man. And, and here there was this scrawny little man with pants, flutters, skinny little braids. <laughs> and there was the guy that killed um, Yumi died. They were made telling this guy he was this great big Elvis Presley. <laughs> uh, the medicine type people, our chiefs, were picked because of their charisma, not because of how many relatives they had but because of the charisma they had to take care of their people. They had to be in charge of making sure everybody was housed, everybody had food, make sure there was no problems in camp, make sure they knew where the next best place is to get food from, make sure he's generous with his people. And uh, so that system worked very well. The societies, we had uh, maybe about four more societies, but they're all obsolete. Uh, there was um, a society below the medicine pipes called the Bulls. Their, their sacred bundles went to the women's society and to the horns. The, that society I always equivalent to the um, Senate. They advised the medicine pipe owner. The Horn Society in the old days would be the war leaders. And this is the crazy dogs were the actual army. They're the ones that sat up on the hills and watched for enemies. They had their, you know, they say crazy dogs, but it should be horse. Ganatsu Mita. So when we say our words, we just take parts of it and introduce <coughs> them into a sentence. But I know from the mitta that I'm all, I, I'm talking about a dog or a horse because we didn't we didn't have an old word for horse. They came. <coughs> we call uh, a horse an elk dog was the size of an elk, but it did the work of a dog. You could carry things on it. So these guys trained their horses so well that their horses would bite people and pull them off or ram into another horse. But that's why they were called the crazy dog. This pigeon society, they policed within the camp. If there was domestic disputes happening, they're the ones that would take care of it. If somebody was being abusive to the wife, they're the ones that would take care of it. And they took care of it. They would take a man, strip him naked, put him on a travoy, parade him through the ground. And anybody that wanted to smear shit on him, pee on him, uh, slap him, Pour hot soup on him, that was your day, day to go to Tama. And I guarantee you that men did not want these children to come and reprimand them. 
if a woman was acting uh, uh, in inappropriate ways, running after other men's husbands, we would take them and tie their dress up here and throw them into a crowd. So no woman wanted that to happen to them. So we used embarrassment to straighten people out. If children were acting up, we would we always had a boogeyman in, uh, in, on the reserve, and these uh, people they considered it their sacred duty to reprimand children. When I was a little girl, my mother used to amutski, um, crinkled face is what they called him. And my mother would say, here's a dollar, you go give it to Amutski, so if you ever act bad, he won't be too hard on you, so. But it was really scary approaching him because, you know, we didn't know what he would do to you, but he'd do something to you if you didn't behave well. So we didn't need our parents straightening us. So we went to our parents for love and attention. <clears throat> but if I acted out of sorts, oh, my mother would tell me, you have a lot of brothers, you want to embarrass them? You want me to go tell your uncle? And I'd be the best kid in the world. <laughs> uh, so that's how we educated our children. We educated them gently. We showed them through example. We, you know, it was kind of forbidden to shout at a kid. We wanted the spirit of the child not to be disturbed. Right from pregnancy. As soon as a woman gets pregnant, the elders start saying, she's pregnant, don't stress her out. She's pregnant. Don't scare her. My brother came in in the house. I'm going to scare my wife with the snake. My mother shouted at him, you get that snake out of here. And don't you ever, ever do that to your wife. You want your baby to be born deformed. You're going to scare your wife. So these this is the way that elders would talk to you. As soon as a woman's pregnant, she was told, don't eat this, don't eat that. If you ate the brains of the animal, your kid would have snotty nose. <laughs> you didn't dare drink soup, the soup broth, because it would affect their lungs. You didn't eat the calves, because you get cramps through your whole pregnancy. You didn't eat too much meat because you get brown spots on your face. Us guys, we like to eat our meat raw, especially our liver and cake. Just a bit of salt. <laughs> My uh, grandma would say, no, you're pregnant. You just have one piece. And that's a big sacrifice, but I had to listen. Um, I was working with the Nichonga Nation. I uh, did a movie. I wrote a movie. I didn't do the movie, but I wrote the movie. CBC got me some money, so I went to the Nichonga Nation and I thought, what a beautiful way of welcoming a baby. And they talk the first night and every night after, they talk their babies to sleep. They tell their babies, when you grow up, this is what kind of person you're going to be. You're going to be my hunter. You're going to be uh, going to going on the ocean and bringing in the fish. But they just talk to the child all night. But our big thing is not to disturb the spirit of a child. If you want to disturb the spirit of the child, slap him. Tell them, hey, you're not good for nothing, kid. And you'll disturb the spirit of the child. Scare that child, and you'll uh, disturb the spirit of the child. So, you know, with what happened in 
in boarding school. That's why we all kind of want children. <laughs> <laughs> but we were really disturbed because of the things that we had to endure. And it's taking some time to overcome that. Not only did we get told that our grandparents would go to hell, I, I even went to confession because we moved my grandparents from Montana up to the Sundance and I spent like four hours there getting there. Then I went back to school and I confessed that I was up at the Sundance. And, uh, I had beautiful, beautiful grandparents, gentle as can be. And when I grew older and started thinking for myself, I uh, thought, you know, I gotta find out if, it, if my grandparents are as evil and as bad as uh, they told me in school. And so when I was 20 years old, I jumped into this. And lo and behold, jumped in feet first into the frying pan. And what a beautiful jump it was. I burnt my feet a little, <laughs> but I, uh, I learned from it. You know, I did some pretty crazy things that uh, later on I found out were real no-no's. When we um, get these things transferred to us, it's like a rebirth. Uh, they have, a, you know, all this furniture is taken out and there's just a, a ring in here. But they'll hold a blanket here, and you have to strip, and they put on new clothes, new moccasins, new shoes, and they, they give you the paint. The paint is very important because that's your degree. In the, in the white man's world, you'd say, okay, I've got the paint, I've got my degree. So because I was formally transferred into there, I have the paint. I was formally transferred into this, I have the paint. I was formally transferred into it, I have the paint. So instead of uh, carrying a diploma, I have the paint. And it's very important because I can now transfer to other people. I, uh, when we get this rebirth, then you leave your old life behind. You start getting your teachings from your elders. And when you're getting your teachers from your elders, you have to go be with them. You can't just come in and say, oh, give me a paper. You have to actually be there. I was talking to somebody else. In my language, you say, I became their hands and feet. You know, I could spend the whole day being a maid to my grandmother. And maybe for one hour, sure, 20 minutes, she'd say, oh, my girl, come here. I got something to tell you. And she'll pass on a teaching to me. Sometimes she'll be passing on teachings me all day long. She'll say, but I had a dream, I want to talk to you. So, well, she'll be teaching me all day. But formally, if I want the knowledge, I go to my holy parents and I tell them, I need, I need some instruction. So, when I first joined this, I, um, I would go get my grandparents, my holy parents, once a week, and they'd come and sing for me. There's 49 songs for this. This is over 100. Some of the songs in here are really beautiful. My favorite one is, 
And that's the deer song. They sing it before they lay out the rawhide for the rattling. And, um, and um, the signs for mountain, in the mountains you see you running around. In the summertime you come down. Uh, my walking is holy. Uh, my mother's favorite song is the um, loon song. And that song, the words for it is, uh, the water is holy, the waves are my medicine. Uh, so, you know, when you hear those songs and the words for it, you can't help but have these holy feelings to the animals that fly and the animals that walk around. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a beaver bundle piece, I guess you can say I'm uh, one of the first environmentalists was the beaver bundle because they told the people, hey, you're killing too many animals, move, we have to go another place. But they, they're the ones that were the timekeepers as well. Every month they would turn over a stick to show we had 13 moons. And um, they, they kept the time and then we had these winter calendars. Each year, the, uh, the big thing that happened in the year would be painted onto this. And that was how we kept our history. That was our only written thing. Okay, in the year, uh, in the year they uh, had two sun dances that happened down on the Two Medicine River. They had two medicine lodges, two sun dance lodges. And it's really rare thing to happen, but it was in the winter time, and the so ladies, two old ladies had the same dream. And so they, right during winter, they went ahead and had a sun dance. So, uh, you know, like I said, a lot of the time were in the other realms, like a lot of our warriors went out and got spiritual teachings from, from going on vision quests. My grandfather, his name was Earth Lodge Man, that's the name that we gave to the Mandan Chokwia we the peaks because they had those great big earth lodges. And my grandfather used to raise those mandans all the time, so they called him Mandan Man. And uh, his power came from the dogs. He could transform into a dog, and his specialty was. Um, was a scout. He would he could go into these camps as a dog and tell the people where the horses were, and and he became a very very rich man. And he was a poor boy. He was walking along. And they only had one horse, him and his grandma. And so they were walking along. He he told his grandma, "You leave camp with the horse, and I'll follow along on foot." So he stopped to drink some water at a stream, and as he was drinking the water, he felt the presence beside him. And uh, he, uh, he noticed this dog beside him, so he started acting like a rich man. And he told him, when we get to camp, you come and, come and eat at my lodge, since we're both poor people. I'll share what I have with you. So he got home. Next thing, there was scratching at the door, and the grandmother was chasing the dog away. And the boy said, "No, no, I invited him." So the grandmother, just to satisfy her boy, brought the dog in and served him like an honored guest. And four days later, 
he had a dream and the dog told him this because you have pity me, I'll pity you. This is what you can do from now on. And he kind of acted like a dog, my you know, in real life, you know, he, the first time they they uh, tried tried uh, he tried this power. You know how dogs just gobble food. Well, he told his friend they had gotten a small um, small buffalo, and so the kidneys were still kind of small. And he told his friend, "Okay, just throw that at my face." And his friend told him, Are you "Crazy." That's really disrespectful. He said, no, I mean it. Throw it at my face. I want to try something out. So his friend took it and threw it at his face and he grabbed it with his teeth. And that's when he knew that he really had the power. That was his test. And after that, when people saw him, you know, they went, he'd say, okay, I'm going to go, turn away. And he'd go off, and some people turned around and they just saw him, saw a dog going. My grandfather uh, did work for the RCMP. He used to take messages from uh, <coughs> from uh, uh, Fort Macau to Calgary to Clooney, and he could do that in one night. All the stuff that I learned. Here, I uh, because I talk to mixed groups. In order for you to understand it, I think uh, I use this medicine thing. Spirituality has nothing to do with religion. Spirituality <coughs> is how you deal with your maker if you believe in a bigger, whether it's a great, a great energy or whatever you call, what I call my creator. That spirituality, it's how I deal with whoever I'm praying to. And when I talk to my, I'm talking to my creator all the time. And so, uh, it's got nothing to do with my religion, my native religion. It's how I, without a religion, treat people. Because the teachings that I've been given deal with how you treat people. Our people don't think this lifetime is all about relationships. That's how my people think, is how you treat people. And, and it's up to you, especially when I'm blessed with all these things. These things, they look after me. So in order for me to continue to get the blessings from these things, there's certain responsibilities that I have to my people, and I have to fulfill those responsibilities. You know, I have a holy daughter that I'm tra traveling with. Well, I treat her like my own daughter. My own daughter, who is my holy daughter as well. You know, the same teachings that she gets from me, Go to my, my own mother used to tell me, I tell her, Mom, I want to go, let's go do this. Well, what did you do for your holy mother? Nothing. Well, go take care of her first. And then when you're finished taking care of her, you come back to me. That's how strong that relationship is. So as a result, I spent a lot of time with my holy parents. And now, um, I really enjoyed my time with them because they, they were really good. Uh, this is your spiritual and your physical. 
the sacred body that you were given to carry your spirit around and how do you treat it? You know, do you give people dirty looks with it? Uh, do you make eat till you're sick? Do you, uh, um, you know, all these things you have to think about, you know? If I was mean with this body and I hit people with it, that's real disrespectful. So I have to really watch this body, keep it healthy, make sure I move, make sure that when people look at me, they know, oh, there's an approachable person. You know, I don't stand around sourpuss and look at me so that <laughs> nobody wants to approach me. As a teacher, I have to make sure that my students want to approach me. I don't want to make them embarrassed so that they won't get the teaching. I don't want to make them feel cheap. You know, reprimand them good. You know, especially if they're doing something bad. Just like I'd reprimand my own children. You know, you go on the YouTube and you watch the slapping medicine man and you'll see the <laughs> way teach <laughs> Oh, that was a good Make sure you go look at the slapping <laughs> and you laugh and laugh. Oh, that's so good. I really hate the internet. Recently I've been flirting with YouTube. Oh. I go all over the world listening to music. Um, my latest uh, thing is Play for Change. And, uh, <coughs> oh man, they got some good singers from Tinarin. Anybody know Tinarin? Uh, well, go look, look it up. Uh, look up Play for Change and you'll be playing music with people all over the world. So, I have to be careful of my body and I have to be very aware of how people see me because I want to be approachable. I don't want people to think I'm just a old bag, mean old bag, but you know that I'll be engaging if I come they come to me. And because I carry these things, I have to be. You know, I got spoken to about it. You know, my, my grandmother told me, geez, she looked mad today. I said, I'm not mad, I'm just thinking. He said, well, when you're out there, don't look like that. People will think you're mad, and they're not going to talk to you. So she made me very aware of my thinking face. <clears throat> Mentally, this muscle here, you got to exercise all the time. Somebody gives you information, don't say, oh yeah, she's right, go check it out. You know, everything I'm saying, don't believe me, go check it out. <laughs> Just the stories I told you, those were stories that, but you know, <coughs> check out what's happening. That way you develop your brain. Because we only use part of our brain. Just a small part of our brain. You know, I told you stories and some of them seem really stupid and silly. Well, how could a man change into a dog? Are you crazy? Well, if you didn't know anything else, and your brain worked that way, very easy. Very easy, because you didn't know anything else. Just before we came and we were talking about birth control. Back in the day, there were medicine men that would just tie 
a string around a woman's belly. And as long as that string stayed, stayed on, that woman didn't get pregnant. If a woman, if we didn't want a woman to have any more children, we gave them a drink and we sterilized them. But we had doctors. There was another doctor that would paint snakes on a woman's shawl, and she wouldn't have any more children. The sacred symbols for the sun dance are the snake and the lizard. You know, the, the, um, the man gets a lizard painted on his chest. Among the, among the, among the Sioux people and the Cheyenne people, they'll say, are you a lizard man or a frog man? You know, that's all part of their sundance. My uh, adopted nephew is a lizard man, so they wear lizards in their heads. And really cool because of the holy work that they do. So when we have children, when uh, the umbilical falls off, we make amulets for our children, and for the boys it's a lizard, and for the girls it's snakes. You can see some of these amulets in museums, but uh, often these days in our Blackfoot men are nothing but a bunch of lounge lizards. <laughs> When you live on a reserve, this hurts the heart, the emotional heart, because you're living close to other people. Uh, when you know, oh, your friend's family just died, they had a death in the family. Well, you go help, you help out. And that's how we survive, because we still help each other out, you know. Nowadays, it's very expensive to bury a person. In the old days, we just offered our bodies back to the Creator. We put them up in a tree. Today, we have to pay up to $16,000 just to get put in a ground. So, um, it's, um, you know, we're living in very different times. Like a lot of the things that we did with our brains, we can't do them anymore. But the emotional part I find hard living on the reserve because you know everything that's happening. You know when young people are having problems. Um, you get impacted by all of it. You know, I work in a prison on the reserve and um, when one of their friends has a wife that dies or something, you should feel that heavy tension in that person. So, uh, you know, this one year, today is my grandson's birthday, my son in rain. He's four years old. So four years ago, the week, the week before he well, two weeks before he died, I had five relatives that died. <coughs> Three froze to death. One hung himself, and the other one was in a car wreck. And the one that was in a car wreck was, we were really close. And I just went for a trip afterwards. I, just, you know, I couldn't hang around the reserve. I just had to go somewhere. So when I came back, my uh, daughter-in-law's cheeks were kind of rosy. Really How are you and why are you I'm all right. And then I was kept watching her. And we got home about 5.30 and I was watching her. Hey, you're in labor. <laughs> yeah, I'm in labor. <laughs> okay, let's go. Her mom told me to watch her really carefully because she had her baby so fast, so got her in the car and said, we're going to stop in Cardston and check you. Lo and behold, she was dilated to eight when we got to the hospital, and her mom arrived and said, I've been Ed, let's go eat. So 
we went and got, a, got her a bite to eat. We came back to the hospital at 7 and my son phoned me and said, Mom, I've got a little boy, my sonny Rain. He's got all of my heart. And uh, the other day when I was getting ready, he comes to my school. I teach at a language nest. I teach the parents and the children. And so my uh, grandson comes to my school around 2 o'clock. He starts trying to figure out ways to come home with me because his mother comes. Uh, Grandma, could you phone my mom and tell him that I'm going to go to my grandpa's now? Well, well, I, you can't go now. We're still in school. Well, just tell her not to pick me up. Okay, baby. <laughs> the other day when I was getting ready and I showered up and, and he came to the bathroom door and he said, Oh, Grandma, you're so pretty. <laughs>
if I went to uh, in front of a big crowd and came up, oh, here are my people, I'm feeding you. I don't get no marks for that. <laughs> I don't even get marks from my elders for that. That's fat, see, they tell me you show off. And, uh, but, you know, when you genuinely feel that somebody's really needing this, then step up to the plate. You know, a lot of times, you know, especially among Native people, we get judged by those poor people that are on the streets. In my community, the people that I find on the street are the grandchildren of these people that took care of this. They were the kids that were told in residential school, oh, you smell like sweet grass here. They were the ones that were told, oh, your grandparents go up to the sun dance. They're going to go to hell, burn in hell. They're the ones who got picked on for going to the sun dance. My own grandmother was a sun dance woman. And her grandsons are out on the street because they could never find a place in society, you know, from being the hierarchy to being pushed way down because of their belief system. It takes a toll on anybody. When you have this Another way I explain it is that I draw a beautiful Cadillac. That's a beautiful Cadillac. And uh, I have an ordinary wheel, a little wheel, a great big wheel. Is that Cadillac going to run good? So, the same here in your spiritual world. If you don't take care of these, be mindful of them, your emotions. Your emotions are what make you sick. You're feeling so bad about something, pretty soon things start to sitting there like the same in the way that your hunched over can cause problems in your intestine. Your liver gets squished and then your pancreas start sticking its tongue out to your <laughs> But so it's really important to look at this. You give off negative emotions, you'll get in trouble if you, if you give off positive. You'll be all right. And it's important to be mindful of that, those things. So, uh, I know some of you are sitting there. How can she be so sure of that? <laughs> well, my grandfather was four lifetimes. He's, this last lifetime he had, he said he was floating around. He was just floating. And then one day he saw this beautiful woman and he thought, I wished that was my mother. And he didn't know anything after that. And uh, they went on a trip up to, to trade up by Edmonton. And on the way back down, they came by this river. And this little boy, he started crying. And his father told him, Hey, my son, my lad, my boy. <laughs> you, uh, uh, where are you crying? And um, I talk like that because I'm close to Newfoundland. We are the west. And uh, yeah. 
the grand uh, the father told him, "Why are you crying?" And he said, "Well, my uh, war party got massacred over here, and uh, so the uh, trading group stopped, and they camped there overnight. The next day, they went across." All the things he said he hid under a rock were still out there. He went right to the rock. He was about seven or eight years old. He flipped that rock over. There are the things that I hide. And he was born with knife scars. And, uh, and he told his people, I'm going to reincarnate four times. I have to reincarnate. He even got to see his old girlfriend. His girlfriend was an old lady, and these two little boys were playing on the ground. And he told the little boy that he was with, you know, that old lady used to be my girlfriend. And that his little companion jumped up and ran <coughs> and said, uh, that boy over there saying you were his girlfriend, that old lady got caught under. Ha ah, ha, you snotty nose kid, what are you talking about? <laughs> that little boy gave his name. He said, you don't remember me anymore, but this is who I was. And that little boy, that old lady took that little boy by the hand, brought him to her husband, and they became equals. The old man and the little boy. The old man treated like that little boy like he was his equal. And so those are the relationships, the sacred relationships that happen because we follow that. Um, I'd like to ask or I'd like to tell you if you have questions, I'm going to be open for questions in a few minutes. So if you have a question, it would be a great opportunity for me to give you a direct teaching. So anything that you want to ask concerning these, I'll uh, be glad to answer. I, uh, I work with uh, prisoners and, uh, because some of them are Catholic, some of them are Presbyterians, there's all kinds of religions they follow, or try to follow, or are supposed to be following. Uh, I use this because this is very modern. It, 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 it came about from people studying those old ways because we were concerned for our whole being. Like in, in my language, my spirit is called no back, my shadow. It's as close to me as my shadow. So the spirit that's going to go on living is, I call it no back, and it's close to me all the time. I, um, I, uh, um, I help revive revise this. I, um, I was very hesitant to lay claim to it, but uh, my holy children have been calling me the modern Rama of the Beaver Bundle. So all the new Beaver Bundle owners, we've had 16 Beaver Bundles repatriated from uh, museums. And uh, they're all in uh, all being used, and because there's 16, I used to make every beaver bundle in the old days, but now I uh, make uh, maybe four or five because sometimes I'll be uh, taking care of one group and there'll be another beaver bundle. Because I passed my paint down to 16, 15 beaver, new beaver bundle owners. We now have people that have learned the songs and are singing them. 
we have so many songs on the New Kids Dance all day. We, uh, uh, when we uh, have beaver bundle ceremonies, the second last song for the beaver bundle ceremony is the dog song. And when we dance the dances, we imitate the animals. So it's so much fun because you get be so silly in there. <laughs> so we'll howl and act like dogs. And people say, don't you dare put a fire hydrant out there. <laughs> so, yeah. um, don't let the cat in. <laughs> mayhem in the teepee if a cat gets in here uh, or, or somebody really big will tease them. You're going to be the chihuahua this time. <laughs> but we have a great time with that. We call that song Home Sweet Home because it's the second last uh, song. The last song is almost like a mating dance. It's called the uh, Akapina one. And it's the white buffalo dance song. And uh, they use the, the hooks to dance with. Two, two women dance first, and we just throw it on the man of our choice. We uh, throw it on their laps, and they get up. Two men get up, and we go to town. <laughs> I can really push too. <laughs> when they try to get near, I just swing away. <laughs> but it's so, uh, you know, you have to, because sometimes you can get sandwiched between two guys. And over the years, over 20 years since I've been working with the Beaver Bundle, I've now I I've learned how to dodge them, so. <laughs> but it's such a fun day you have. Like the, when they sing for the flicker, if the people don't know, you can go. They can sing the whole dance, and that one guy will be dancing, and he'll be wondering why they're not stopping to sing. Is because he has to tell them stop now. But we sing the first. Opening songs we sing are two are for the trees. We shake the trees, and then when the trees are shook, then uh, the beavers know that there's trees. Then we sing the songs to the beavers. In my home, nobody can come to my door and knock. In my home, when people visit me, they just walk in because. To make a loud sound by a beaver, they, they swim away, and you don't want them to swim away. Uh, I don't, my daughter has my beaver bundle now, but I uh, sometimes get called upon to watch a beaver bundle. I babysit beaver bundles because when there's a death in the family, we have to take that bundle out. Our holy people here are not allowed to mourn for a whole year. We're only allowed to mourn for four days. And uh, we can mourn in private, but in public we can't mourn. Uh, once those four days are passed, we go through a cleansing ceremony. After that cleansing ceremony, then we uh, have to start our holy duties again. Even if your hearts break. We have to continue doing our holy work because we have a whole bunch of holy children that we have to take care of. Some of you have never seen me with short hair, but I had to cut my hair this year because my oldest brother died. I lost him in July. But I was just given four days to mourn for him. And uh, I have to use all my female strength to keep the tears at bay and continue the work that I chose to do. So now, is there anybody with a question? Um, I think 
Pardon? Is there a turtle song for you? A curler? Turtle. Turtle. Oh, no. No, I just wondered. Yeah, uh, but we do have a name for them. Spoopy. Spoopy is what we call a turtle. Yeah. And uh, I didn't, um, you know, because they're not really indigenous to our area. They're like further north. Uh, further uh, west, I know in BC they have turtles, but in southern Alberta they don't really have turtles. So, uh, but um, one of the beaver bundles, somebody gave them a turtle rattle, so there's a turtle rattle in one of the beaver bundles. One of the medicine pipe bundles has a rooster, and another one has a cat. Uh, you know, we didn't have cats here, and one of my elders, we have these boxes, and we put dirt in there, and that's where we put the hot coal. You know, I used my portable altar, but at home we have a box of dirt, and my uh, el elder, he put his, uh, you know, so the kids wouldn't, he'd slide it under the bed, and a cat peed in his oh. altar. Oh, was he mad. Walking down the hallway. He stopped. That's another thing Christopher Columbus did. He brought the cats. <laughs> oh, the so bad. It was so much fun, my teacher. He, he's the one that, um, his name is Joe Crochu. There's stuff written about him. If you want to look at Blackfoot history, Google him. He had a doctorate degree. They got the Governor General's Award or Order of Canada or something. But he was really a highly honored man. He uh, he was one of the elders that was flown to Nova Scotia to welcome those tall ships. And the boys that he were he was with, they stole a rowboat and they rowed out to a Russian ship, went up on the chain, and they stole the Russian flag. <laughs> well, these are the clues that we count. So when men go and do this, they can go to a ceremony because certain parts, in order for them like to hit the drums, they had to sing, have four coups to hit the drums. In order for us to take the food out of the teepee, we have to have coups. So that's where they got the to. Uh, when they dance in the Sundance Lodge, they have a fire, a sacred <coughs> fire that they start. And in order to light that fire, they have to count four coups. And a lot of the American veterans, that's when they get to say that they did not war. Because a lot of these young people that, that Bush sent to his fake war, and they got killed over there. A lot of them went over there. They did stuff. But this is how our people recognizes them every time. Feed that fire, they have to count one more story and throw it, put it in. So, a lot of our young men, and we understand that we understand what their pain is. You know, with this one man, I used to pull this guy's out for lunch. <coughs> and then I heard his war stories. And uh, <coughs> when I heard his war stories, I could never say, ah, oh, this guy. Mm -hmm. I had one other question. Um, do you, um, could you tell us the story of the white buffalo? Mm -hmm. The white buffalo? Yes. Oh, yeah. <coughs> we have a very stupid story. Like, for us, <coughs> Sundance, our Sundance, if we can get a white buffalo to tie the poles on, that's a very, very powerful Sundance. Like, they'll hunt these white buffaloes. They're very rare, but they'll hunt them to 
to use for the sun dance, but that's what they're for. The Sioux have a different story. Um, what's his name? There's a lady that I knew in uh, New Mexico. She did uh, um, um, the sacred buffalo, and she did all the artwork, um, beautiful artwork. Uh, with, uh, I think his last name is Brown, but we'll look at that But all the pictures from the stories this man got from the elders she drew. Do you have any special ceremony for medicine for women who are um, making that change to becoming grandmas in, in, in menopause? Is there anything special, any ceremony that happens for them? Oh, lots of stuff. You can uh, go to any of these, but usually it's the grandmothers that are talking to you. Like in this day and age, because we're so impacted by other chemicals, like in the old days, it's, uh, menopauses were very gentle. Uh, they uh, uh, started much later and ended much quicker because there was no chemicals at all. And they had certain plants that they drank. Uh, I think one of them is arnica. It's a yellow flower, tiny yellow flower. It kind of looks like uh, um, a sunflower, but like a tiny little sunflower. And they uh, they would make a tea for that after a person had her baby, and then they drink it again when they go through their change of life. When I was going through my change of life, my daughter got me this spray. And I thought I was having a heart attack. My first hot flash came from here out to now. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> And then I found out that real women don't have hot flashes, they have super surges. <laughs> so I was having these super surges. Um, yes. I just wanted to say what a, what a great honor it was to hear you speak about, you know, all these medicine, medicine bundles. Um, where we go to, my wife and I are Sundance people down in Montana. And Montana? Montana. Where? <coughs> uh, Wolf Point. Hmm? Looks like Wolf Point, Montana. <coughs> With where's many Larry. tail feathers? <coughs> where's many tail feathers, yeah. Um, you know, some of those Sundances have come into our ter territory. Yeah. We have a Cree Sundance, a Sioux Sundance, and a our Blackfoot Sundance. So, uh, uh, they're different. Like, I know the Sioux and the, the Cree are very male-oriented. And, uh, uh, but us, it's very female-oriented. Like, uh, in the Cree and the Sioux, they really deal with the moon time a lot. But in ours, she's the only woman that can have her ceremony whether she's on her own time yeah. or not. Yeah, because is, she's uh, pure. Uh, 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 it's a great honor. And and the elders tell us, I've been told since, you know, since the beginning, that as long as we have our bundles, as long as we have our ceremony, our people will live and have good life. That is, to me, very important to uh, see that these bundles like this and our people will continue. Hi, hi. <coughs> Anybody else? Anybody else have a question? <coughs> So, I guess you guys must have learned uh, all that you wanted to learn. <laughs> um, I, I hope you have a better understanding 
of some of our ways. You know, these ways here are that I talked about are, are from my people, but I know the different tribes have very similar ways that have big holy ceremonies and uh, they have different, their ways are just a little different than mine, but I know, I can tell you from the bottom of my heart that all the people in the Americas were very prayerful. They, they had a great sense of the spirit world, you know, from the tip of Peru to the, you know, to the icebergs out there. I mean, we, we were such a spiritual people. And I think because of our spirituality, a lot of people thought we were, um, easy push over, is that a good mm -hmm. word? But they walked over us because our, our, our values were, you know, we were feeling sorry for them where they were trying to destroy and not really coming to try and learn and to understand what we were about. Like I can speak a smattering of three languages my um, my grandfather was born in Deutschland. He was born in Deutschland. Dry mom. It had the very lustig time. I can't say. Yeah, but I can get along in German. I can go to German, travel alone, and I can talk to people. I can go to. Cuba, and I can uh, talk a bit of Spanish there. I speak English fluently, and uh, I've uh, yet to meet any European that I uh, can speak my language. Yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, I just remembered you saying you worked in the prison. What's in the prison? And I, I just want to say what a, what a great honor it is for to have you do that. Um, I myself work in the prison system. And uh, we had the opportunity to bring bring some men with us from, from there. And to hear you speak and to, and to listen to you. I, I believe that these men are, are, are healing in that way. And, and part of that journey is hearing you speak. And, uh, Men are very close, very close to my heart, and I know that uh, that you've touched them. I believe in that in that special way. Thank you. Bye bye. All right.